Thanks so much, Dina. I don't know if it's true, and I don't even know actually how you would uh, go about checking this, but I read that more has been written on this uh, chapter, Mark chapter 13, than any other single chapter in the whole Bible. So settle in, I guess going to be here for a while, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't worry. Um, but I do think that this is one of the most misunderstood chapters of the whole Bible and one where context is really, really important. And many scholars think that I'm not in any way trying to have, uh, you know, unique insights here. I'm, I'm very much relying on people who know an awful lot more about it than me. But we are going to spend uh, some time this morning looking at both the historical context, the context uh, in which Jesus said these words, as well as the context in which um, Mark's readers would be reading these words several decades later, and also the literary context, the context of the narrative itself and how that links to uh, the Jewish scriptures that predate it. If you've been able to join us over the last few weeks, you'll know that we are tracing Jesus's uh, steps, his, his journey in the second half of Mark's gospel from Galilee up there in the north uh, down to um, Jerusalem, a, a journey of a little over 100 miles. And last week, Jesus finally made it to Jerusalem, the capital city, the, the seat of political and religious power. And if you missed last week's uh, message, I'd encourage you to listen to it online, where we did a wonderful job of uh, digging into that story of Jesus uh, going into the temple and throwing over the tables of the money changers and the, the sellers of doves. And this chapter very closely uh, is, is very closely connected to that chapter, actually, to so that story, as we'll see in a minute. Our passage starts with uh, Jesus and his disciples leaving the temple. And as they do so, the disciples say, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. As was mentioned last week, um, the temple was huge. It was built on, on a mount, on a, an elevated platform that had been constructed um, on a hillside in Jerusalem. And it covered an area of about 35 acres, which is equivalent to 26 football fields. Your football, not my football, not soccer, football, football field. According to the first uh, century uh, uh, Jewish historian Josephus, 18,000 men were working on it up to its completion in the 60s. And the stones really were massive. The smallest weighed between two and five tons, and the largest one remaining, which is part of that retaining wall for this uh, mount that was built, um, is unbelievably huge. It's uh, 40 feet long, 10 feet high, 13 feet thick, and it's thought to weigh round about 300 tons. So when the disciples said these stones are massive, they weren't exaggerating. And these stones were massive and the buildings were magnificent. And through the miracle of technology, we can see that for ourselves in this brief CGI clip. It's going to take us, it's just a very brief clip. It's going to take us a tour of the temple. Let's see that. <laughs> Um, this is actually from a, a free interactive app that you can download if you'd like to, if you have a lot of time to waste. 
which uh, apparently I do, <laughs> so there you go. But there actually is a 20 minute narrated uh, version of this where he takes you through all these chambers that you probably wouldn't find on your own. I didn't find them on my own. Um, that's done by a Jewish rabbi and professor, and it's really fascinating. So I've actually put the link to that in the discussion questions for this week for the, the uh, history nerds amongst us. Um, but I, as you might tell, um, I totally get where the disciples are coming from here. This place was magnificent. But as Wesley was saying last week, it was also incredibly corrupt. The wealth amassed by the temple was staggering. Josephus, that first century historian, is kind of renowned for uh, exaggerating. So we have to take all of his uh, figures and numbers with uh, a little bit of salt. Uh, but he wrote that the temple's cash reserves were 2,000 talents of gold, which in today's prices would be more than $1 billion. The gold statues and wall coverings in today's prices would come in at around an additional $4 billion. Now, again, he's probably exaggerating a little, but clearly the temple was phenomenally wealthy. No wonder then Jesus railed against an institution that didn't help the poor, but rather made them think that they needed to give the last of their coins, you know, everything they had to live on. This temple system was presided over by four aristocratic families who were allied with uh, Rome. And it was from these families that the high priests were chosen. But there were also tensions between uh, Rome and the religious leaders, particularly shortly after the time of Jesus. In 40 CE, Emperor Caligula planned to defile the temple as a show of strength. He actually died before he was able to do that, uh, but word of it leaked out and caused, uh, as you might imagine, quite a bit of strain between uh, the religious leaders and Rome. Uh, this was made worse by the next emperor, Claudius, who expelled all the Jews from Rome, uh, probably uh, in, in 49 uh, CE. And Josephus tells us that resistance to Rome in rural areas was uh, very much on the rise in the 50s and 60s, particularly in Galilee, where we saw the, you know, the first half of Mark's gospel took place. And then in the spring of 66 CE, Emperor Nero stole the gold from the temple, and that radicalized the, uh, the priests and they supported various armed rebel groups to chase out the Romans and assume control of the city. That Jewish coalition didn't last any time at all. The common people hated those aristocrats who had colluded with Rome, um, and they forced them out of the city. The rebels then burned the temple financial ledgers, which is where all the records of people's debts were kept, um, and they put a commoner uh, as high priest. In response, the Roman imperial guard attacked Jerusalem, um, but they were defeated, and that made the aristocratic families think that maybe they'd back the wrong horse, and so um, they came back to Jerusalem and tried to take control of the rebellion, uh, and that, as you might imagine, did not go down well. Uh, so there was a whole lot of internal fighting, and basically it was really all-out class warfare, uh, coups and counter-coups, purges of one faction with another, and the temple was often used to uh, house the troops. Now, obviously, Rome was not going to tolerate a rebellion like this, and General Vespasian was dispatched by Nero in 67 CE, and he took, interestingly, the same journey that Mark says Jesus took from Galilee down to Jerusalem. He was proclaiming the rule of Nero, the savior, the bringer of peace, and the son of God. But unlike Jesus, uh, this general was ruthless with regard to anyone who did not accept and embrace uh, Roman rule. He had a scorched earth policy, and while the elites quickly switched back to the Roman side and were saved, including Josephus, huge numbers of the poor were massacred or enslaved. Vespasian arrived in Jerusalem and was preparing to siege the city when he was recalled to Rome. Uh, Nero had just died, and civil war had broken out as, as four people, Vespasian being one of them, uh, were vying to be the next emperor. I just want you to imagine for a moment what that must have been like for the Jewish people. You've had this brutal dictator marching through the city, arrive, through the country, arrives at the city gates and is all set. You must have thought, that's it, we're done. We're going to be massacred. We're going to be, you know, that's it, it's over. And suddenly the Romans are gone. And in fact, they wouldn't come back for almost a year and a half. That must have seemed like an act of God. You know, Yahweh had come to the aid of his people. This tiny, weak nation had actually chased off the imperial forces of Rome. And they knew that those forces would be back. But now, maybe if they all stood together, if Jews everywhere stepped up to fight, 
How could they possibly lose this holy war of independence? According to Josephus, a lot of different people claim to be the Messiah during this time. And you can imagine that, right? You know, I'm the one who's sent by God to lead this holy liberation movement. Meanwhile, back in Rome, Vespasian beat out uh, his rival to become emperor and sent his adopted son Titus to finish the job in Jerusalem. Titus mounted a seven-month siege of the city, uh, and that led to mass starvation. There are some really horrific stories that uh, Josephus tells about that time. And after several unsuccessful attempts to storm the temple where the troops were holed up, uh, the Romans simply burnt it to the ground in 70 CE, and they looted the temple and the city. And Josephus reports that 97,000 people were taken captive from the city, and 1.1 million people starved or were killed by the sword. Now, again, it's probably an exaggeration, but unquestionably, these were devastating losses for the Jewish people. As we've said in previous weeks, we don't know exactly when Mark's gospel was written, but it's probably in the mid to late 60s, time of incredible unrest, when either Israel was about to or was actually in the midst of an armed uprising against the Roman Empire. If you think we live in politically polarized society, imagine being a Christian in the 60s. Mark's readers seem to have been a mix of Jews and Gentiles. Now, Jewish uh, Christians had been expelled from the synagogues by this time. They'd experienced some persecution. So they wouldn't have particularly felt warm feelings for the Jewish leaders, religious leaders. Um, but at the same time, isn't this what they've been waiting for? This Jewish uprising, this throwing off the yoke of Roman oppression. Isn't this what the Messiah was meant to bring? Surely they should sign up. And what about the allegiances of the Gentile Christians? Were some of them Roman soldiers, uh, Roman citizens? We don't know, but chances are, it's a good chance. Certainly this was a very politically sensitive time, a very emotional time to be talking about Jesus criticizing the temple. So this is some of the historical context for this chapter, the context for Jesus' words, as well as how it, it would have uh, been heard by Mark's audience. Let's look now at the literary context. Where does this chapter fit in with the story? That well, it comes at the end of a group of stories. Yeah, there we go. Uh, set in and around the temple. Now, we didn't have time to cover all of these last week, uh, but this is the flow in Mark. So Jesus is headed for the temple. He's hungry. He goes up to a fig tree that looks great from a distance. Um, it's covered with beautiful leaves. But close up, you can see there's no fruit at all, and Jesus curses it. Then he goes into the temple and chases out the money changers, sellers of doves, the people carrying uh, merchandise. He stops them carrying it through the temple. Basically, he interrupts the business of this wealthy and powerful institution. And then he teaches the people that the temple is supposed to be a place of prayer for all nations. The next day, the fig tree that Jesus cursed seems to be dead from the roots up. Well, it is dead from the roots up. And Jesus again talks about prayer. Then he goes into the temple and gets into a conflict with the religious leaders over the issue of authority. They ask him, you know, who gives you the authority to come in the temple and act like this? And he turns it on its head and, and asks them about their authority. Then various religious leaders try to trick Jesus but a scribe recognizes that Jesus has got a lot of wisdom and asks him, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus declares that the scribe is not far from the kingdom of God. Then Jesus watches a widow giving her last two coins, all that she has to live on, and says that she, this, this vulnerable widow, is giving more than all the rich and powerful people. And then he leaves the temple, and according to Mark, he never goes back there again. So with the exception of this conversation with the scribe, all of these stories present a very bleak picture of the temple. And today's passage, chapter 13, caps that all off. And these stories have woven through them this metaphor of a fig tree. As was mentioned last week, um, there were lots of theories about uh, why Jesus, when he encountered a fig tree that looked beautiful from a distance, but had no fruit, when it actually wasn't the season for fruit, said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, it could have been that Jesus was just hungry and forgot that figs don't grow in the spring. But that seems rather unlikely. The harvest season was the big deal in this agrarian culture. More likely is that Jesus is enacting a parable. And in fact, Luke takes this story and says it is a parable 
uh, rather than being a, a historical event. Um, and Jesus is probably drawing on the imagery of the prophet Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, there's a passage called the Song of the Vineyard. It's a metaphor for God forming and tending the nation of Israel. And in part, it reads, My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And the song goes on to say that because it failed to produce good fruit at harvest time, the owner, God, would completely destroy the vineyard. So then the next day, Jesus and the disciples pass the fig tree again, and it's dead. It's withered from the roots. And Jesus says this. Have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. Sorry, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This seems a bit random, right? Uh, suddenly we're talking about prayer, but I don't think it is random. I think Jesus is saying, praying against a fig tree and it dying, that's nothing. You can pray this mountain into the sea. Which mountain? Well, it's not totally clear, but the context for all this, remember, is the temple. The temple that looks so beautiful from a distance, but that has completely failed to produce fruit. The temple system that is rotten to its very core to its roots needs to be destroyed possibly the mountain and that word can mean any elevated place is referencing the temple mount this mount that we should pray is thrown into the proverbial sea or proverbially thrown into the sea the temple was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations the temple was where sacrifices were made for people to receive forgiveness but jesus says pray in faith and you will receive your prayers will be answered forgive others and you will be forgiven. You don't need the temple to pray and to be forgiven. If the cursing of the fig tree was an enacted parable to condemn the temple, um, it was a subtle one. But you've got to remember just what a sensitive topic this was, both during the time of Jesus and even more so during the time when Mark is writing his gospel. And certainly Jesus earned a reputation for saying he wanted to see the temple destroyed. In Mark's gospel, he's accused during his trial of saying, I will destroy this temple made with human hands and in three days will build another not made with hands. And later while he's hanging on the cross, he's mocked for saying the same thing. If that is what the cursing of the fig tree is all about, then it's interesting that Mark adds that this was not the season for figs. Jesus therefore is not willing to wait until the fullness of time for judgment to come. He sees the rottenness of the temple system that goes all the way to its root and he wants to see it gone. As theologian Esther McKell phrased it, Jesus makes use of metaphorical images and pious exhortations consecrated by Israel's tradition to express in a subtle way that if it was in his power, the temple would have already disappeared. Then later that day, Jesus uses the same passage in Isaiah, the Song of the Vineyard, to argue that he, rather than the religious leaders, has God's authority. In fact, he retells this song and changes the ending. Let's read that. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. 
So when Jesus is retelling, it's not Israel, the vineyard that is destroyed, but rather the tenants, those entrusted with caring for the vineyard, those with the responsibility to tend the fruit and to deliver it back to the owner. They are the ones who will be punished. Unlike the cursing of the fig tree, this parable is not at all ambiguous. The religious leaders know straight away that he's talking about them, and they do indeed tend, intend to kill the son. Note, though, Mark is not saying that anyone with any connection to the temple is condemned. He includes a story of the scribe that goes like this. One we know well, but we'll read it anyway. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debate, debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The scribe gets it. He understands that the offerings and the sacrifices in the temple are not what it's all about. It's about love. God, loving God, loving one another. And compared to that, nothing comes close. So Jesus leaves the temple for the very last time. And what do the disciples say? Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. They didn't have emojis back then, but if they had, yeah, I think that would have been one. Jesus responds, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Now, the temple that was around in the time of Jesus was the second temple. The first one built by Solomon was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE. And at that time, the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of God's spirit leaving the temple and moving over to the Mount of Olives and resting there. And that scriptural Im imagery seems to be repeated here. Jesus has moved out of the temple. He's gone to the Mount of Olives and is sat down. The presence of God has left the temple. And then the disciples ask him privately, where it's safe to talk about sensitive issues like destruction of the temple. When is this going to happen? And what will the sign be? Now, no, they're not asking him not asking him, when will you have died, been resurrected, ascended into heaven, and then come back again a second time in glory? That's how this uh, passage is often read out of context. But it is very evident in this context that what they're asking about is this magnificent temple. When will it be destroyed? This is not idle speculation about something that may or may not happen way in the future. It's, it's an immediate question of what will happen to us and how will we know what to do? In answer to the first question, when will this happen? Jesus makes two statements. He says, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And just two verses later, he says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So evidently, Jesus knew it was going to happen relatively soon. The end of the temple system was not far off, but he didn't know exactly when. Jesus, as fully human, does not know all of the details regarding the future. Being human ne necessitates living in the flow of time. Jesus didn't have certainty about everything that would happen. And yet he was committed to the way of love, wherever that might lead, even all the way to the cross. And Jesus begins his response to the disciples' other question about a sign by saying, in effect, don't panic. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be famines. There'll be earthquakes. These things happen. They're not signs. And people will come along and saying that they're the new Messiah. Don't believe them. And you'll be betrayed and persecuted for following me. That's not a sign of the end either. Stay calm, persevere, be faithful, and you will be saved. 
And if Mark's gospel was written during the Jewish uprising, this passage also carries the message that Christians don't need to take sides. This war is not the messianic final battle. It's not the holy war that they need to sign up for. And refusing to get involved in the war would no doubt be a very unpopular move. Uh, your own family would hate you for it, but it's not the end. But, says Jesus in verse 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. The reader doesn't understand. <laughs> we don't understand. But that's one of these, um, you know, if you get my drift kind of a phrase. Mark is being very careful how he's writing here. Then let those who are, are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on a hilltop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. So what is this abomination that causes desolation? Well, this is a phrase taken from the book of Daniel, sometimes translated the appalling sacrilege. And it was used in Jewish apocalyptic writings. That is writings that um, provide cryptic revelations of ways that God uh, dramatically intervenes in history. For example, in 1 Maccabees, which is a book in uh, the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, it's not in the Protestant Bible, uh, but in that book, the writer tells the story of King Antiochus IV Epiphanes, great name, terrible person. He um, conquered Jerusalem and sacrificed pigs on the temple altar and erected a temple to, uh, erected a statue of Zeus um, in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And the writer of Maccabees employs that term. He writes, on the 15th day of the month Chisleth, in the year 145, the king erected upon the altar of Holocaust the abomination that causes desolation, and pagan altars were built in the surrounding towns of Judah. And other writings similarly apply this term that's taken from the book of, da of Daniel to other acts of sacrilege. So Jesus is using a well-known but non-specific term here. He's saying when you see gross sacrilege, whether that's um, idols being erected or Roman soldiers enti em entering the holy places or whatever it is, run. Flee the city. Run to the countryside. Now, I assume that if the whole world is ending, it's a bit pointless to run. But Jesus is not talking here about the end of the world. He's talking about um, a disaster that he can see brewing on the horizon. Tensions with Rome are becoming more severe. The temple system is corrupt. People are tired of being oppressed and exploited. And when it all comes to a head, get out of there. Don't take up arms and protect the temple in my name, says Jesus. The temple's doomed. It's rotten to its roots. Get out. Unfortunately, we know from history that they didn't get out. They actually crowded into the city where they were slowly starved to death. Jesus continues, but in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly body will be shaken. Now you can see from the punctuation here that Jesus is quoting scripture. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah again, who writes about the destruction of the Babylonian and, and the Edom kingdoms, two foreign uh, kingdoms. With these words in Isaiah 13, it says, um, the stars of heaven and their constellation will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. That's about Babylon. And then about Edom, the destruction of Edom, he writes, all the stars in the skies will be dissolved and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. So Jesus is saying this coming destruction of the temple is what happens to corrupt and oppressive powers that stand against God. It's exactly what happened to the, to, to the kingdom of Babylon and to the kingdom of Eden. Ultimately, unjust systems will fall. God will bring them to an end. Jesus goes on. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Okay, well, this is definitely about Jesus coming back at the end of time, right? I don't think so, personally. I know some people interpret it that way and write whole series of books on it. Um, but the context here is the destruction of the temple. We're talking about events that, according to Jesus in this passage, would take place within the lifetime of that generation 2,000 years ago. 
Jesus is once again quoting the, uh, the book of Daniel, this time from chapter seven, where Daniel has a vision of one like the son of man who suffers at the hands of uh, foreign powers and then comes with the clouds of heaven into God's presence where he's vindicated and given power and glory and the authority to rule. There is no mention in Daniel of the son of man coming down from heaven, but rather going into God's presence to be vindicated. The temple, the place of religious power will be destroyed. And Jesus's way of self-sacrificial love, love for God and love for neighbor will be vindicated. And what's the sign? Well, it's the fig tree. One fig tree had been cursed and is now dead from the roots up, but there's another fig tree putting forth growth, another temple that will be built without hands. Learn the lesson of the fig tree. The old order needs to pass away. The new is coming. And when you see the leaves, you'll know it's just around the corner. When we read this chapter, I think we often find it a bit scary or disturbing. I don't think that Mark wrote it to frighten his readers, but rather to comfort them. Yes, devastating events were ahead or perhaps even underway, but Jesus predicted this. God has not abandoned us, Mark seems to be saying, or being caught off guard. We don't need to panic. It's not the end. Faithfulness to the way of Jesus is what matters, not taking up arms. And what's more, there's life beyond the fall of Jerusalem. You can still pray. You can still find forgiveness without the temple. You won't be lost or scattered to the four corners of the earth without the symbol of Jewish nationhood. God will gather you up. This is not the end. And yet, ironically, so many com commentators, not all by any means, uh, but so many have turned this passage into teaching about the end of the world. Partly, I think that's because we don't read the Bible in context and we pull verses from different scriptures and, and stick them together to make an argument. Partly because I think we assume everything in the Bible is written to answer our questions and we're not asking about the fall of, of Jerusalem. Um, but mainly, I think, because there is something very appealing about the idea of Jesus coming back very soon and pulling us out of this mess. There's something comforting about the idea that there's them and us, people are in and out, and we're in, we're sorted, we're on the winning side, and Jesus is coming in, is going to step in and save the day. But this passage is not, I don't think, about finding hope by avoiding trouble or being lifted out of it or rescued from it but rather finding hope in the midst of wars and famines and earthquakes and persecution. Hope that Jesus and his way of self-sacrificial love has already been vindicated by God. Hope that corrupt and oppressive systems will one day fall. Hope that whatever happens to us, this is not the end. Hope that even when the world is scary, even when our temples fall, even when our sense of identity and significance is burnt to the ground, even when those we love turn against us, Jesus' words are still as true today and as relevant as they were 2,000 years ago. As Jesus puts it, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. John May, uh, a Jesuit priest and professor of English, studied the concept of apocalypse in American films and literature. And he concluded, mature faith accepts the enduring struggle that historical existence entails. I like that. Mature faith accepts the enduring struggle that historical existence entails. Just like Jesus, we don't get to see how everything is going to get played out. But we're still asked to continue in the way of love. Jesus doesn't promise here a sudden and easy victory, but he tells us that we won't face anything alone. The Holy Spirit will be with us, empowering us, comforting us, helping us to know how to respond. The world didn't literally end in 70 CE, but for many people it did. And I don't just mean those who, who starved or were killed, but for many people, the loss of the temple, the fall of Jerusalem was absolutely devastating. But there have been so very many devastating events since then. In effect, the world ends over and over. On a global level, injustice and oppression prevail, at least for now. On a more personal level, people we love die. Dreams are crushed. Whether or not at some point in the future there will be an ultimate cataclysmic event that brings all of human history to an end, I don't know. 
but all kinds of things happen in this generation that for some people feel like the end of the world. But if the world ends over and over, so too Christ come over and over with words of hope that never pass away, with a message that this is not the end, with the assurance that oppressive systems will be destroyed and the way of love has already been vindicated, with the promise that we're not alone and that we will be gathered up from whatever distant place life drives us to. We're going to take communion now if the band would like to come back up. We use gluten-free crackers and grape juice so that everyone can participate. But when Jesus first instituted this practice, it was part of the Passover meal and would have been unleavened bread and wine. And it was unleavened bread, it was flat bread because people made it quickly and didn't have time for it to rise. They were fleeing the city or the country to, to escape enslavement in Egypt. And they needed food for that long, hard journey to liberation. Unleavened bread was fuel for the struggle. We don't eat cake for communion, right? It's not food for people who are, who are sitting back in ease and, and living a carefree life. This is food to meta metaphorically keep us going in the hard times, to remind us that we have hope because Jesus is with us, giving us the words to say, telling us not to be anxious, not to give up, telling us this isn't the end, that we'll be gathered up. Jesus is with us in whatever situation we are facing, no matter how dark the world seems. This is also a communal meal because we don't need to go through this alone. We have each other to support us and encourage us in hard times, to laugh and to cry with us, to be there for us when we feel like we can't go on. And during this time of response, uh, you might want to, to pray with someone, someone that you are sat with um, or someone at the back. Um, please, please come and, and we'd love to pray with you. Or feel free to write out a prayer and you can put it in the frames or we'll pray for you during the week. Um, and there are other ways to respond. You might like to light a candle uh, at the station at the back or um, in the back, uh, right, my right corner, uh, our station of lament or the justice, uh, racial justice stations here at the front. Um, all kinds of ways to respond and they're, they're listed on the front page of your flyer if you're unfamiliar with them. But first, uh, let's take a moment to pray. God, we long for rescue. We long to be lifted out of hard situations, but instead you join us here. You hold us, you come alongside us. As we walk through hard times, you, you tell us that we don't need to be anxious, that this is not the end, that you're there with us, that the way of love is what we need to stay true to. We're safe with you, no matter what happens. I pray that we would really know that deep in our hearts, that we'd be able to really trust that and to rest in your promise that you're with us and for us and that this is not the end. May that, those words become reality in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. When you're ready, please feel free to come forward and take communion.